Welcome back to the AI Daily Brief. We love a good survey around here, especially one that has actually meaningful methodology and a big enough sample size to credibly back up the claims that it's making. We recently got another one from online learning platform Udacity, who are now owned by Accenture, that has some interesting stuff to say about the state of AI use at work. So what we're going to do today is look at that study, compare it with some really interesting data from Ramp, and then connect the dots to a recent Andreessen Horowitz piece to ultimately hopefully give you a sense of which AI office tools are actually most useful right now. So first up, let's talk about this study. The way that they sum it up is with their big banner headline, 90% of workers use it, most still don't trust it. Now, like I said, from a methodology perspective, Udacity surveyed 2,000 professionals across a variety of different industries, job levels, and age groups. And as we found with every study, even the ones that have been held up as examples of AI being overhyped or not actually useful enough, everyone is using these tools. I think at this point, we can just say that everyone is using AI. 90% of workers that Udacity surveyed said that they have used some type of AI tool in their work. Unsurprisingly, for anyone who spent any time in the enterprise AI space, about half of those workers, though, say that their employer doesn't pay for any tools and broadly speaking, just don't feel supported by their workplace in their AI tool usage. 42% said that their companies don't have clear AI use policies, and around a third of workers are admitting to using unauthorized tools. A full 72% of managers say that they've paid out of pocket for AI tools they need for work. There's also some interesting generational stuff that I think I'll save for a different time. The way that they sum it up is that Gen Z feels most comfortable with how AI may impact their careers, but they're also most critical of others who use it, with the speculation being that perhaps they just have the most clear-eyed view of how disruptive and important simultaneously AI is going to be. But the thing that I wanted to focus on for the sake of this larger discussion and getting to this A16Z survey of which tools are actually performant is this number right here. According to the Udacity study, three in four workers regularly abandon AI tools mid-task, most commonly because their outputs lack accuracy or quality. Going further on this trust question, 45% of respondents said that they don't trust the quality of a colleague's deliverable if they know it was created with the help of AI. More than a third think less positively of colleagues who regularly use AI at work. And 36% would rather colleagues avoid AI use in their deliverables altogether. Udacity sums this up as trust being a major barrier. And what was really interesting to me is that this isn't the only place we've seen this idea of trust being a barrier show up recently. Ramp is a bank slash finance solution for startups and companies, which means that every month they process billions of dollars in business-related expenses. That creates a really interesting source of data. And each month, they actually rank the vendors that their customers are purchasing from to help people understand what are the emerging trends in what tools people are using, which companies seem to be penetrating the enterprise mainstream, and so on and so forth. The story of these monthly surveys has basically been AI, AI, AI for a very long time at this point. From a pure play standpoint, the top SaaS vendors last month by new customer count included OpenAI and Anthropic in the number one and number three slot. But what gets more interesting is in the fastest growing vendor category. Here's how Ara Karazian, an economist at Ramp Economics Lab, explained this on Twitter. He writes, Execs at large companies have told us the inability to trust AI is holding back adoption. So it makes sense that two of the fastest growing vendors on Ramp are AI that's more trustworthy and reliable for enterprise use. So they're pointing down into that fastest growing category. And the two that they're looking at are the number two slot on overall new customer growth, which is called Augment Code, and the number three on new overall spend growth, which is Brain Trust. R calls Brain Trust a platform to monitor performance, toxicity, and hallucination in AI models. Brain Trust calls themselves the evals and observability platform for building reliable AI agents. So basically what you have here is infrastructure that surrounds AI and agents to make it more trustworthy to hopefully improve its results. And that's the number three fastest growing vendor when it comes to new spend. Augment Code he describes as an AI coding platform that can work with enterprise scale large code bases. And it's clear where they're trying to differentiate from some of the other agentic coding platforms is around the things that are going to matter for an enterprise use case. So take this together and we've got a survey saying that trust is a big issue. We've got vendors that deal with trust showing up in the enterprise data, meaning that this is a problem that people are trying to solve. Which brings us to this post from A16Z, that's all about which AI office tools actually work. The thrust of the piece is basically A, there are a ton of tools, B, not all of them are great, so C, here are the ones that actually work and for what. Now, by way of setup, the team at A16Z divides AI productivity tools into two different categories. One of the categories are the horizontal tools, 
that are broad-based in general and are meant to handle things across apps and tasks. On the other end of the spectrum are vertical tools that are all about going deep on a very specific workflow, which could be email, could be slides, could be a spreadsheet. So what are some examples? Well, on the horizontal side, you have general assistant tools, like all of the generalist agents that we talk about on this show quite frequently. We've got Manus, GenSpark, OpenAI's Operator. Interestingly, they also put this new crop of agentic browsers like Dia and Comet in that category. Versus where I think a lot of folks have felt like the higher potential was, at least in the short term, which is the vertical focus tools. You've got companies like Gamma that are building PowerPoints and presentations. Platforms like Paradigm, which are focused on spreadsheets. A bajillion platforms that are focused on meetings, note-taking, and all that sort of thing. And then, of course, a bunch of AI-focused email platforms as well. But the question isn't so much, are there tools for all these types of work? But instead, do they work? So the way that they tested them was for each of the different high-level use cases to create basically a rubric for success and rate them in a green light, yellow light, red light kind of way. Basically, how well they did at each of those different dimensions. So for example, when it comes to PowerPoint slide design, one of the things that I think people most want Office AI to be good at, the five vectors that they judged against were generation time, how long it took to get the output, visual design, did it actually look good, content quality, was the information presented well and comprehensively, for editability, once you had that original generation, was it easy to work with to make better, and five, prompt alignment, how close to what you asked for did it actually give you. Now, they rated a combination of the vertical and horizontal tools against each other. They didn't strictly segment this. So in the case of PowerPoint, for example, they compare Gamma, which is a more dedicated information presentation tool, to GenSpark, Manus, OpenAI Operator, and Claude, which are all obviously more general purpose and horizontal. They found that different tools had different strengths and weaknesses. Interestingly, all of the tools except the one that was purpose-built for this use case had high prompt alignment, while Gamma, that vertical tool, only had medium prompt alignment. However, overall, when it came to the PowerPoint or slide design use case, Gamma they ranked as the best. In three of the five categories, generation time, visual design, and editability, it was green lights, with content quality and prompt alignment being the two yellow lights. Of the general purpose tools, GenSpark did best, with two areas, content quality and prompt alignment in the green, and generation time, visual design, and editability, all in the yellow. Now, part of what's valuable about this as a rating system is that I can see different people prioritizing different things in what they're looking for out of these tools in a way that would make a simple thumbs up, thumbs down, who's better or worse type of rubric a lot less useful. For example, maybe I'm a great designer or I have my own aesthetic or I want to use mid-journey or something else or I already have a slide template. I might care way less about visual design in that case, but much more about content quality. Maybe I don't want to spend a bunch of time editing to improve the comprehensiveness of the data. I just wanted to nail that. In that case, even though technically Gamma has more areas in the green than in the yellow, maybe I'm going to prioritize GenSpark or Manus because they rank highly in content quality. Likewise, if I'm trying to do this fast versus it's just going on in the background, that's going to have a big difference in how much I care about generation time. Still, from a practical takeaway standpoint, it sounds like if you want to go build slides with AI right now, two tools to check out are Gamma, which is a purpose-built tool for information design, by the way, one of the things that's cool about Gamma is that it'll also create a website for you and a scrolling PDF all at the same time. Or if you want to try a more general purpose tool, it looks like GenSpark might be your best bet. I should caveat here that I have not gone and replicated this myself. I'm just sharing what A16Z found, and a lot of this is going to be very subjective, but it's presented in the context of you going and doing your own experiments as well. Next up, spreadsheets. The prompt that they had for this was trying to extract all the data from this PDF and calculate operating margin. So it was basically a prompt about working with the data in spreadsheets. For this use case, the five rating areas were processing time, data extraction, calculation accuracy, format design, and analysis quality. One really positive thing on the spreadsheet use case is that all of the tools they tested had high calculation accuracy. They were all in the green. When it came to data extraction, three of the four general purpose tools, Manus, GenSpark, and OpenAI Operator, were all high, while the vertical tool Shortcut AI was only medium. That said, that vertical tool shortcut performed in the high category on calculation accuracy, format design, and analysis quality. So again, from a takeaway standpoint, if you want to go experiment with this yourself, and as before, you want to try one general purpose tool and one vertical tool, it looks like A16Z would suggest trying Manus for the general purpose approach and shortcut AI for the vertical. For use case number three, email, the tools that they're looking at are basically assistants that are embedded in email. 
In this category, they looked at three of the vertical tools, Fixer, Serif, and Jace, as well as one more general purpose assistant that's embedded in their AI browser. The prompt was email to schedule a dinner next Thursday, and the five categories of review were draft quality, customization, context awareness, chat UI availability, and calendar coordination. Fixer was the only one that scored in the green or yellow across all of the different categories. Use case number four is research. And I think that outside of drafting content, this is one of the most ubiquitous personal use cases for AI among basically every professional that I run into, at least. The prompt was to summarize and compare the latest quarterly cloud revenue growth from Microsoft, Amazon, and Google in a table with sources, then analyze the drivers behind the results in a short report. So it's important to note here that the prompt includes not just data collection, but also organization and presentation. For this, they compared all general purpose tools, Manus, OpenAI Operator, and then two browsers, Comet and Dia. And the TLDR is that they pretty much all did this pretty well. In fact, the only tool to score in the red in any of the categories, which, by the way, for research were process time, data accuracy, table quality, analysis depth, and source attribution, was the Dia browser, which scored low in both analysis depth and source attribution. Manus and Comet both had three out of the five categories in green and the other two in yellow, while for OpenAI's operator, it was reversed three in the yellow and two in the green. One note, too, if time matters to you, the native browsers were insanely fast. While it took about four minutes for Manus and about five minutes for Operator, the prompt took 20 seconds in Dia and just eight seconds in Comet. And like I said, it seems that Comet did as well as Operator and close to as well as Manus in a tiny fraction of the time. The last use case they shared was meeting note-taking, where they focused on vertical tools, Granola Mem and Notion, and they used ChatGPT's record mode as a more lightweight alternative. First, it's very clear that the more lightweight alternative was not well suited to this, having four of the five categories in the red. The five categories, by the way, were note quality, customization, collaboration and integration, real-time support, and retrievability and search. All three of the vertical tools had three categories in the green and two in the yellow, although the distribution of those were a little different in each case. Meaning, once again, if you were trying to figure out which you should be using, you might want to go dig into the specifics so you can prioritize what matters most to you. Overall, A16Z had three big observations. The first is simply that there is already a clear dividing line between these categories of tools. The vertical products and the horizontal products are emphasizing different things, and their strengths and weaknesses follow from that. The second observation is that the competition, particularly around the horizontal products, is very intense. They write, general assistants in agentic browsers are in a race to become the core UI for work. Given the importance of both speed and accuracy, companies that are closer to the model development may have a better chance at delivering. Major research labs are still entering the race. Anthropic has recently launched a browser copilot for Claude, and we expect more attempts from OpenAI and other players. Meaning, without saying you shouldn't invest time in something like Manus or GenSpark, they have a very challenging road ahead, given the competition that's likely to come from the foundation layer. Lastly, as much as the vertical and horizontal are clear in how they're trying to differentiate, A16Z thinks that convergence is coming. They write, the sharp lines between vertical and horizontal agents are starting to blur as vertical products look to jump into new categories and horizontal platforms double down on popular use cases. I think taking a step back, my general advice would be a few parts. First of all, I think it's pretty clear from this that no one in really any of these categories can claim total dominance. Because of that, we're probably in a period where, as difficult as it is, the best strategy is to be omnivorous when it comes to which tools you're trying. I think from an AI usage hygiene perspective, the more time you can take to have at least a small stable of tools that you're using, the better off you're going to be in keeping up with the latest developments. The second thing that comes from that, though, and this one is maybe a little bit relieving, is that it feels like the performance is close enough in a lot of these categories that it may make more sense to invest in figuring out how to really get the most out of the tool that you're already working in, rather than trying to jump around wildly. For example, if you are a Manus or a GenSpark partisan, I'm not sure that anything in these tests, at least, suggests that you need to jump ship to go to the other area, and probably your time is better spent on figuring out how to work with the particular foibles and strengths of the tool that you are already engaged with. Lastly, I think it's probably going to be important not to get too attached to any particular tool. This landscape is changing incredibly fast, and the thing that's most useful today might not be the thing that's most useful tomorrow. Ultimately, view each prompt as its own little adventure, and I'm sure you're going to get great results. For now, that's going to do it for today's AI Daily Brief. Until next time, peace.